And hello, everyone. This is Michelle Oliver. I'm here today with Lisa Michelle Zega, and we are also live on Clubhouse. So excited about that. And today we are having a courageous conversation about trust. So just if you have not been with us before, um, this is our Monday to o'clock Mountain Standard Time, that would be one o'clock Pacific Time, and on the East Coast a couple hours later, so four o'clock, I think. And we come to you every Monday with what we like to call courageous conversations, simply because they are completely unscripted. We take a topic that sometimes we may have talked about before in a clubhouse room, and then we also go live each Monday on Clubhouse as well to talk about these. And we really want to open this opportunity up for courageous, candid conversations for women in midlife, because there are a lot of topics, ladies, that we have an opportunity to explore in new ways. This is a safe place to have these conversations and to actually explore what these different topics may mean to us now. We can give them new meaning. We just never know where these things are going to go. So we, we keep it to an hour. And if we finish earlier than that in Clubhouse, we can open it up for some Q&A. But today is a pretty big topic. And we just kind of threw out this word, trust. And I know we talked about this a little bit before, but sometimes Lisa Michelle likes to give a definition. Hello, how are you? Hello, hello, hello. Exciting to be here on this magical Monday. Yes, it is a magical Monday. You know, I had looked up a a definition too, and I must have closed it. Um, But just that idea of being, you know, something that can be some a quality or experience that can be counted on, some that we consider reliable, trustworthy. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was interesting looking at some words that are related that have the same root words as trust, like ashtray was one of them. And I was like, and betrothed ashtray? was one. Yeah. And I thought I didn't know there were ashtrays anymore. Ashtray. Well, I and and so it was just uh right. words that share the same root. And I and I just thought, well, maybe that's because it's whole, you know, you're trusting it to hold something. Like I, I'm counting on you to capture. I don't know. So I was just my brain was going there a little bit. But yeah. It's so funny that I closed it and didn't realize it. <laughs> so that's okay. I mean, we can look it up again if you want to, but I was, the word that stuck out to me in the conversation, we had a, a very general conversation about this. It, it Honestly, as some conversations tend to do, it segued into like a, a river of other <laughs> topics, but I do remember the word reliability really stuck out to me. And um, yeah, so big topic. It, I, I mean, I can go with this unless you want, I'd love to hear from you because I, I know that. So just so you all know, Lisa Michelle works with women primarily women in midlife, and she helps them through the grief process. And that can be, I mean, I'll let her speak to that, but then she moves them through that into life coaching. And I work with women in midlife also as a coach, and I focus more on business. I'm really big into this revisioning your life thing right now, which has everything to do with um, the holistic version of business, because As you know, your business is an extension and an expression of you. So you may have some something to say about trust. Well, I want to say something that is is not specifically about trust, but is really kind of bridges the work that you and I do. And it was just it was a quote that I heard today, and I found it quite interesting. So yeah, what the women that work with me often recognize that they're going through some sort of grief um, based on like 
the death of someone, a spouse or a, de a divorce after a long-term marriage. But the thing is, grief is our body and heart's response to loss, period. And when we don't know how to metabolize it, we just carry it and it accumulates. But what I heard, uh, this was by a woman named Brooke Castillo, who runs the Life Coach School. And this, she was talking about feeling your feelings and how some people are like not very in touch with their feelings. And, and why don't, I don't know. I slow down. I try to feel my feelings. I feel nothing. And what she said, and this is what I felt like bridges the gap between our work, Michelle, is if you're not feeling your feelings, then you're not setting big enough goals. Set a big ass goal. You'll feel your feelings. All kinds of stuff's going to come up for you. And you work with women on pursuing these audacious goals in their entrepreneurial pursuits. So that was, um, and you know, one of the things that comes up are the areas where we lack trust and specifically self-trust. And one, I'll just say what's on the top of my mind today as we talk about the uh, as we talk about trust, and maybe this is from what I recognize. Um, I had a session with someone today, and it really came up that sometimes we're looking out there for someone else to show us, you know, that they are trustworthy while we're in the midst of breaking promises to ourselves and not being trustworthy to ourselves and how prone we are to look externally before we look internally. And I think that that's a phenomenon that's pretty common among just people, like it, we're not bad or broken because we do that, but just to notice when we're wanting someone else to behave toward us in a manner that we're not even willing to behave toward ourselves. And that's where I'm thinking about trust this morning or this yeah, afternoon. I, I guess it's this afternoon. It's this afternoon already. Self-trust, being able to trust ourselves and follow through on the promises that we keep to ourselves. That's a really, really huge <clears throat> thing to discuss. So what comes to my mind around that is yeah, it is human nature. It's not just women. Um, and we, it, it really relates to everything where we are, we have a tendency to look out here for where we lack or what we need or what we want. And I think at least for me, the growing process is really, and I think it's true for everyone, has really been about where is that fulcrum of control. And it is within us. And we have the ability to give ourselves those things that we need. And it's just such a knee-jerk reaction when we get triggered by something, some grief, right? Or unresolved grief, mm -hmm. unresolved childhood trauma or whatever it is that we just automatically want to blame. We're looking for control. So if, if something doesn't feel good and we want it, we want it and you're not going to give it to me, then it's your fault, right? So I can't trust you. I think, um, I know for sure, actually, that most all of the women I work with, this trust issue comes up, not only with trusting ourselves, but initially, we've lived some life by this time yeah. and betrayal is very common. I mean, everyone's been betrayed in one sense of the word or another, but often in relationships, in marriages, I mean, a lot of stuff has happened. And so um, I know that I hear this from women a lot. Well, I, I'm so hurt. How do I, you know, I'm so hurt from, from not trusting other people checking to see who's coming into our clubhouse room. Gotcha. Got a big crowd in there. <laughs> <laughs> it only takes two to be a crowd on, yes. this, on this show. <laughs> we have so many brilliant thoughts that it's almost like having an audience of 
enlightened experts. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I enjoy your personality so much. Um, it's a good thing. It's, that's why you keep showing up, right? I think that it, <laughs> it's true. So when you were talking about the fulcrum of control, I started thinking and just asking myself, okay, Lisa, when are you most likely to give up your own power or your own fulcrum of control? Where, where are you, or to break your promises to yourself? And I really do think there's a very close tie between our promises to ourselves, the, the power that we um, activate in our own lives and trust with feeling um with our our ability to feel our own feelings because one of the things i was thinking is yeah i'm most likely to break a promise to myself when there's something going on inside me that i'm not wanting to be present to and like and i can always tell like i'll show up at the food cupboard and put something in my mouth that's not in line with what I've said that I'm gonna do in terms of nourishing or, or caring for myself in a certain way. But if I'll slow down, there's something that, that wants to be felt or experienced by me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, feelings can feel really, feelings can feel, that sounds so funny to me, really powerful like they're going to overwhelm us. Um, they can feel very uncomfortable, but if we're able to be with them, they really don't last very long. Like, and it's, it's like the waves in an ocean, you know, and just letting them pass over us. But I think we've been um, socialized to intellectualize what we're going through, to try to explain what's happening rather than to simply experience an emotion in our body. and. I don't know. What do you think about that in terms of relating to trust and and self betrayal and all these kinds of things? Mm -hmm. Well, I know that there are two women who used to go to the refrigerator and open the door and eat. <laughs> but we just completed this fast that we did together for accountability, so that doesn't happen anymore. Um, no, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm kind of, I'm actually not joking. It's true. But yeah, so I mean, feelings are energy, right? And I mm -hmm. always, I always love thinking of toddlers. Toddlers go, they go from devastation to extraordinary bliss within a period of 24 hours or 12 hours or whatever. And if you just watch them, you're just releasing it physically. And so, yeah, I, I agree with you, of course, that whenever we have like a blocked emotion and we do have to learn how to heal and, but we can learn. It's so, oh, simple. yeah, we learn it's real to, simple if we, mm -hmm. yeah, to stay with the emotion and then let it go. But I think what kind of, what I was thinking in terms of how that relates to trust is, um, well, okay, this is where it gets complicated <laughs> for me, but I think there, there could potentially be a tendency to not, it's all about self-responsibility in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. we either say, okay, I'm taking responsibility for how I feel. I mean, I've learned more from the people who betrayed me than anyone else in the world. And what I learned was, oh my God, I just simply betrayed myself. It was my mistake. I didn't realize I was learning and growing and gaining more self-awareness and more self-control and more um, power and identifying with you know, that power within me rather than needing someone else to fix it for me or save me or show me the way or, you know, invest in my business, honestly. Um, yeah. So I think betrayal is a gift. Well, I, I will say uh, having experienced betrayal, the deeper I dug in that, in my own journey, 
what I did find at the root. Oh, well, I, I want to be careful saying at the root, what I found underneath that was layer upon layer upon layer of self-betrayal. Mm -hmm. And then I also found, you know, patterns that I had developed of learning to cope from when I was much younger. And when I was able to look at it more like a bird's eye overview, rather than just being identified, like I am a failure, I'm a mistake, I'm whatever it was that I said about myself. By the way, that never helped me take personal responsibility. It actually no. made me feel more dejected and more hopeless and more weak and more prone to be betrayed by other people, because, right? But anyway, yeah. when I so, went to the um, underneath that, I found a lot of self-betrayal when I went, was able to look at it from a more um, elevated position. I could have so much compassion on myself and like you be able to harvest so much of what I have learned. And even just very, very recently, I tend to be um, a pretty impulsive person and a big hearted person. And I made a business decision where I was leading with my heart. Mm -hmm. And depending on how you interpret that, all of my business decisions in one way are led with my heart. But in this way, it was led with this compassionate desire to help and not thinking everything through. I made a quick decision. And then as it began to unwind, I felt very, very foolish. And I felt like um, in the topic of trust, I didn't think I was reliable or had the ability or strength to, you know, like I projected way out and made it into this, what it meant for me as a business owner, you know, altogether. And there was a lot of shame that I felt. I didn't trust myself to be able to deal with the emotions of shame. So at first I was avoiding. And then I just sat with the pain of the decision I had made and the results from it and asked myself what I was going to do and asked from the, you know, from my future self. In that process of feeling some really uncomfortable feelings, I was able to take personal responsibility for my impulsiveness. I was able to take personal responsibility for how I will make business decisions in the future. I ended up building a great deal of self-trust. And I just chalked it off as like, okay, this was a profound learning experience that, you know, cost three thousand dollars well this is a it awesome it i will learn a great deal and i'm gonna harvest all that i can so it's just interesting to me that by weaving it all the way through i ended up developing a greater self-trust um but at the time it it felt i just felt like such a loser yeah well, that is a great story. And I, I appreciate that you shared it because this is what I love about business, honestly, is that the, the way you learn is this, like I, I've done that many times. And I, as you were speaking, I was thinking about my own most recent version of that. When I, I totally lost a business, I lost, I lost way more than that. <laughs> a lot of stuff. I mean, it was the, the single most traumatic experience of my life, but it came from, and I had a business mentor at the time who constantly was telling me, uh, trust, but verify. And I was like, no, I feel it. I know, I know in my gut. Right. And, and um, yeah, I got, I mean, it was ridiculous how obvious it is now when I look back, what was happening in that scenario. Um, but I got royally screwed. It was millions and millions of dollars. It was like a, but you know what? It happens to everyone. Yes. And it happens to people in business and they lose, you know, billions of dollars. I mean, it's, yeah. it's part of growing. 
And, um, and so you learn to walk more circumspectly. So this idea of trust, but verify, I, I guess I don't really uh, subscribe to that so much. It's, it's more like, I really don't trust anyone, any human being. And not from a place of like, you hurt me, I won't trust you. But I trust, I, I'll tell you, I, get, I, I know this sounds super crazy, maybe not. But the fact is that I trust the overall goodness of the universe. I trust that I can get through anything, absolutely anything. I trust that everything always works together for good. Now in those circumstances or like when someone betrays you in a relationship or whatever, it still is. It's just that our eyes have not, you know, we're blind. We are blind to our blind spots, right? So like when I look back and I think, God, how did I not see this mutiny that was literally occurring before my eyes? And why did I not stand up and stop it? And why did I, you know, then you can do like what you were talking about. You look back and you go, oh my gosh, next time I will have I will have a lawyer. Next time I will have the contract. Next time I will protect myself because I value my ability to see what's going on and I can control that. You can control it to a certain level, right? Yeah. But yeah. when you just go in heart first, um, a lot of times this happens with women because we just trust and it is foolish. It's, it's not negative foolish it's a lack of of experience and knowledge and then you get it and then you know there's another lesson around the corner <laughs> so. and that's just it is um i i do think this is like teasing this out because when you said i i trust the universe i trust that all things work together for good and i trust myself to be able to get through anything I have a proven track record of being able to get through gnarly shit. Just, I just, I have that. I have a track record of things working together for my good. I have a track record of being supported. And I'm like, yes, I too am right there with you. And yet when that first feeling uh, washed over me, of like, it was when I first felt the splash of Lisa, what did you do? Right. In the, in the business thing I was just referring to, yeah. I was so, I felt a sense of, I want to say now looking back, it was a cross between humiliation and shame. It was some sort of, I didn't trust myself in that moment to get through that feeling. Like, in other words, my first response was, not to say, okay, baby girl, bring it on. Let's feel this feeling. Let's feel it deep. You have what it takes to get through this experience. No, I didn't want to feel it because you know what? The thoughts seemed to come so quick that it disqualified me from this heart passion of serving the world as a business in the way that I get to do it. And, and so all of a sudden that shame felt like too much was on the line for me to actually feel the feeling. Okay. That's such a lie. But, and, and so I was just reflecting when you were talking on how is it that in these big things of life, I'm like, I can get through anything and here comes a wave of shame and I don't trust myself to navigate that. So I'm like trying some avoidance technique until I recognize the only way to do this is to go through it, have the experience, all the avoiding is just going to bury it. And so, yes, I did end up going through it and I trust myself more, but that's like, it just seems wild to me that human experience that, but in the little thing, I'm like, ah. yeah, well, if I, okay, this is, this is what I think about that. If I'm understanding you clearly and you, yeah. you will, you can correct me if I'm not, but, um, 
I mean, there are definitely times, and this is what men tend to be better at, I think, at least in my experience, they're better at compartmentalizing. And so there is, that is absolutely, in my opinion, an incredible skill to be able to say in the midst of the chaos or the, the crisis, I can default to that vision, like you're talking about, like, okay, wait a second, we're just going, I mean, honestly, I, I think like I trained my staff for that. You have to, you just be like, okay, those emotions, boom, they, they're just fueling where we are going. And that thing is pulling us there. Right. And, and then you can go back and process it later when you can do it with, you can give it the attention it deserves, but, um, yeah. And, and then if you don't, it will bring you to your knees and you won't be able to get it off the floor. Trust me. I think we've all been through that too. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. I think it's, um, I think all of it matters and all of it is relevant and, and all of it, all of it, like the, the thing about trusting the process of something and like trusting the universe or God or whatever you call it. Um, I, I think like if there are women watching this, that the fact that you're standing here right now means you do know how to get through the gnarly shit, right? Yeah. And you are, so you're here, but what we learn is how to do it more efficiently, how yeah. to do it more playfully, how to, how to do it, um, with less drama and less triggers. And so that life is just more like glory to glory to glory, right? That's the, like the ultimate. Yeah. Um, and you just like, you were saying waves. I love that because like, with the toddler, like they don't forget that they love life because they go so they, they let the emotion take them. Now we can't really do that when you're running a business or whatever, you have to be able to compartmentalize and say, okay, I'm going to come back to that later. But the problem is we don't. And then, like you said, the word you use is um, metabolized. It gets stuck. And then we don't trust anybody and we back off and we're like, no, no, no. You know, I've seen this in corporations that I've worked with where they're like, I'm not going to do that motivation bullshit. Like that's such stupid fluff. You know, it's because they don't want to feel anything. Mm -hmm. They don't want, they will go to any length, more manuals, more rules, you know, shut it down. <laughs> so yes. yeah, I think we have to, like, we're holistic, right? Yeah. Yes. And that was the thing is in that example, I was trying to evaluate it too quickly and my emotions, I couldn't, so I'm trying to write it out and I I couldn't get there because it, it was much bigger than what I, I'm, what I was tempted to write out was much bigger than what actually was. So to rein it in and just isolate oh, it too. this is Lisa, this is an isolated event. Let's look right yes. here. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that really fascinates me because we've already talked about betrayal and betrayal at its essence is, is broken trust. Mm -hmm. right and right. and we tend to make a very big deal i think about broken trust when it quote unquote happened not quote unquote why am i saying that when it happens from an outside party to us and mm -hmm. we tend to really brush over when we're the ones making a promise to ourselves and breaking it repeatedly and and perhaps partly because that is so human but i'm i'm curious about how that what kind of relationship we end up with with ourselves and if we're not in fact more prone to being betrayed out there the more um self-betrayal is just our norm what do you think um so what you're saying is you're, you're asking what I think about having a habit of like self-betrayal. 
and how that influences our relationships in the outer world. Like we're going to see, does it make you more susceptible to betrayal? Yeah. Well, I, I would say yes, because I think, I mean, honestly, I play these games, right. Where it's like, I'm making everything happen. Like if you're going to be a black and white person, you might as well just go all the way and say, it's all me. The, the world really is mirroring back to us everything that we are. So when people come, and I think it's funny because it's like, think if, if a little child promises something. Like, I promise I'm going to brush my teeth. And then you find out they didn't do it. You don't go, oh my God, they lied to me. They betrayed me. I mean, you don't, you, you have perspective, uh, right? <laughs> and uh, so, but when the guy that you just head over heels in love with, and then you see him like flirting with another woman, you're like, oh my God, you lied to me. You don't just love me. You love her. You're looking at other people. And then you go down the spiral, right? So I do think that it always, and again, the emotions, you've got to feel them. You can't be like, I will not react if you, you know, we're not robots. If you look at her, um, but we do, I truly believe that if we are really connected to our, ability to perceive the blessing in everything. Like you can literally train yourself to see advantage, see opportunity, see the good. You can teach yourself to see that. And it will annoy the hell, you know this, it'll annoy the hell out of everybody. So you shouldn't speak about it too often. Uh. But in your own mind, you can be like, I wonder what I'm learning from this. And so with the betrayal thing, if you keep lying to yourself, then that's what you're going to see in the outer world, right? And you're going to expect someone else to fix it. But when you start being able to follow through on your own obligations, you're going to see that reflected back to you from other people too. It's like in sales, you know, like when you, um, I remember learning this many, many, many hundred years ago when I was young and I thought, why do I keep running into this type of person? They, they tell you whatever objections you're hearing from your prospect, it's because you don't have certainty in your own mind because everything is always walking from where you are to the certainty of the, the desired outcome. And so um, it's the same thing. It's like as within, so without, like that's the way it works in all truth. I, yes, yes, that we're going to continue to come up against whatever our internal objections are, right? In, in the outer world and in, and, and all these other um, things. But one of the things that you said that is really standing out to me and something I think can be so resourceful for myself and all of us is you said, look, if a toddler says, I'm going to brush my teeth and they don't do it, we're not, our whole world is not falling apart. And I thought, wow, that could be a very resourceful lens. So mm -hmm. like, for instance, if I say to myself, I'm going to eat, I, I don't know what, you know, all plant-based foods today. I'm not going to put any processed garbage in my mouth, right? And then I go and lo and behold, there's the hot Cheetos in there that my son loves, which I happen to think are like a tasty crack treat. And then I find myself eating hot, hot Cheetos. To look through the lens of, wow, Lisa, that and this actually goes along with brain science. I'm kind of tripping out right now. Our prefrontal cortex is our thinking, planning brain. That's the part of me that said, I'm going to put all nutritious foods in my body, right? Then the, the then, then I go and see it. And this is just this impulsive part of me that feel good, taste good, must have, you know, that kind of thing, <laughs> <laughs> right? And, and, and a I, cookie monster. Yes, I did the sound like a cookie monster. But, the, but yeah. this idea of the impulsive little toddler 
And then to be with myself in that, to recognize, okay, Lise, this isn't a thought through decision. We don't need to punish the toddler and throw the toddler against the wall, right? No, but let's recognize, hey, would you like to build your life on the impulses of a two-year-old? Or would you like to intentionally think about what you're going to do and keep your promises because your promises are made from your higher self to your higher self, from a place of empowerment to a place of being empowered. So I can be gentle with myself. I can recognize, yes, I was feeding the toddler, you know, brain or whatever. But at the same time, saying, all right, but are we going to steer the ship from the place of the conscious or the unconscious? Are we going to create the life? And that just seems, um, because betrayal is such a heavy word. And we do have ways of, uh, and there are bigger things than going to the hot Cheetos in, that we do to ourselves that can really tear down the fabric of a life. I still think it's helpful to recognize this paradigm and I, I find it very useful just considering it, Michelle, and I wanna say thank you. I'm, I'm pretty sure that Mr. Rogers has said that familiar, similar things over the years. <laughs> We did. So, to, but here's what came to my mind when you were sharing that. Um, so what if, so again, and betrayal is a huge thing because the loss, right? And I'm not excusing, by the way, there's, I always feel the need to share disclaimers. Um, this is simply a conversation. <laughs> this, these are simply my thoughts of the moment, which I'm pretty consistent with, I think, but I'm not, I'm not, um, you know, sanctioning betrayal by any means, but, but what I'm saying, when you're in the, on the opposite end of it, and the quicker you can understand, you know, the notion of hurt people, hurt people, the quicker you can understand like with the, the little child. Okay. It's really easy to go right to, I, you know, what's going on? It's probably, he didn't do it because he hates mommy. He didn't do it because he, he hates his teeth. He's not afraid of the toothpaste. You know, there's, it's every behavior as we learn as parents is a code for something that that child needs help with. And the same with us and the same with people that hurt us. So when that person betrays you, like, one of the people that betrayed me, I, and when I look back, I'm like, it was so obvious the um, agenda that was planned out because I was so blind. I didn't even see this agenda. So now I see the agenda and I can think, oh, it wasn't even necessarily against me. It was just to benefit them. Even like in the case with the looking at the other girl or whatever the thing could be, you know, it's not that they're maliciously planning to hurt you. Mm -hmm. They're just filling a need. They, they're, they're looking for how to, they might not even be aware of it. So um, the quicker, the more quickly we can get to that place of how, how, how did I like, what is this about me? What can I learn about me? And always bringing it back to, um, you know, how, how can I learn? How can I grow? And seeing, like you said, the bird's eye view, because otherwise, like, don't you, I don't know about you, but I do know women who, I mean, oh gosh, I know one woman who happens to be my family who got divorced. I think it was like 30 years ago or something. And she's still talks about that. Like, how are you? Well, you know, I got, I'm still, my, I got divorced. <laughs> like whatever you, when you don't go through the emotion of it, but if you go through with perspective, you can heal yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think we've all got people in our network who whose own life is being sacrificed at the altar of being right about being betrayed. Yes. And it's like- That is a great way to say that again. Cause that's like- Whose, whose own life 
is being mm -hmm. sacrificed at the altar of being right about being betrayed. Yeah. And, and that I would say is a grave self betrayal. Like I'm going to give you 30 years of my life so that I can be right about the harm you did to me. Meanwhile, yeah. what, meanwhile, I've literally given away 30 years of my joy, of my freedom, of my happiness, of my, and I'm not like, especially in the work I do, I'm never like, just get over it. Like, no, go through it, experience it, harvest from it, take all the learning, all the wisdom, all the nutrients, all the goodness, release the pain, release the resentment, let go of that which is harming you because it's harming you <laughs> and you're so valuable. I'm so valuable that, um, but there is something very pernicious and very delicious about being right. So much so that, cause we always have to look, what am I getting? Cause I don't just give my life away for nothing. I give my life away for something. So what is the trade? And that's what we want to pay attention to. It's like, what's this costing me? Yes. What's being right costing me? Yeah, that being right is interesting because my mind is going in a couple places with that. And that is so, so true and absolutely incredibly powerful that when you recognize that you are actually betraying yourself by not forgiving and moving on to more expansive life, not dealing with it. So that's huge. The other part of, um, of being right, I think about how I don't, and I know like if, if I'm sure if I were in therapy, I'd be told, well, there's some attachment disorder and you should be trusting people. But what I, what I do understand is that um, with things like political uh, dissension or health issues or, um, you know, there's so, there's so many, <laughs> so much stuff going on right now, you guys. Um, but I learned a long time ago to trust my learning because I research like crazy. So like, I know we have this shared experience of homeschooling and I've shared this before where I just found when I make a decision about something, um, it, it, it has so seldom been popular that I just trust no one to tell. I mean, very, not, that's a lie. I'm sorry. I trust some people, but I'm like the general population. I don't go out there and be like, this is what I do because I'm protecting myself. And I don't want to waste my energy trying to educate or prove or whatever. So I was thinking about that in terms of being right too. And it's amazing. I, I noticed like when I was at Costco today, <laughs> I, um, one of, I have a, my older son is going to be staying with us. And I bought a bag of potato chips, which I never do talking about Cheetos. And I'm walking out and the woman says to me, those things are addicted, addicting. And I was like, I, I don't touch, you know, I wouldn't put them in like right now. I wouldn't put a potato chip in my mouth if you paid me. Well, it depends how much, but <laughs> everything has its price. But, um, but she said, she didn't leave it there. And I was just like, I, I know I don't touch them. And then she's like, do you know, that's really going to hurt your heart if you eat them. Anyway, people will just so lay their opinions on you, you know, in the, the most random ways. And so I did learn a long time ago, not to, to try to engage in these things and just to trust that I am right about this and I'm going to stay strong to it. And then the other thing about betrayal is that it's interesting what you were sharing because I had this realization a couple of nights ago when I was speaking with this family member and uh, we don't agree on anything. So I never say anything. 
I never say anything except I love you and how are you? That's it. The rest of the conversation is her telling me what I think. And in doing that, that was the word that came to my mind was how she was betraying herself by like, and also you can betray the potential for a relationship Mm -hmm. by throwing that crap on other people. So I think trusting that we know how to shift the rudder, we know how to navigate the waters and let the emotions be the waves. And just having a general overall trust that people are good. Like people aren't out to kill you. They're doing it from some weird motivation. They don't know a better way. And um, yeah, that's- There are two things coming to mind based on what you're sharing. And Mm -hmm. one is I, you know, I've told you this, Michelle, before that I've had the honor of walking with several women through severe betrayal in their marriages. Yeah. In every case, um, when each person, the man and the woman went deeper in that process, yes, they uncovered things that they had not wanted to look at, they ended up building a greater level of trust within themselves and Mm -hmm. within the marriage and the marriage went much, much deeper. But that was, it was like the, just trying to get the needs met without going through the pain of transformation or the pain of grieving what was coming up for these individuals. So that was the one thing. And then the other thing, when we are talking about trust, I I started to realize, hey, I think people are thinking of self-trust, like just trusting myself today. And I was like, but the interesting thing about us, and this was when you were talking about your family member and betraying herself and the potential, right? And you were using it as the potential of relationships with others. But I was like, what about the potential of the relationship with the future you? Because mm-hmm. we, there are so many iterations of us all the way until, well, not only do I believe that there's a Lisa who will die on this earth, but then a Lisa that will go on beyond what we know as life on this planet. Regardless, just thinking about the Lisa spanning a lifetime as we think of it in our human years, right? Well, I'm in relationship with 80-year-old Lisa. So everything I do today is moving me closer in a more integrated, loving relationship with her or creating a chasm between us, right? And so part of me keeping a promise to myself is not just about me. It's also creating a trusting relationship with this future iteration of me who I believe already exists and yet I'm not like there yet, right? And so she's pulling me forward, but I just think it's super thought provoking to recognize we we get to have a relationship with not just one another and not just the Lisa of today in my case, but the future me and that that holds true for each of us. What do you think? Um, yeah, (laughs) for sure. I think I almost spit my tea on you. That was so funny. (laughs) Well, I think that, yeah, go ahead. It'll just ricochet. I know that's what I mean. (laughs) It's like instant karma. If you believe in that. Okay. So what I was thinking of all these future selves and like, are we getting into parallel realities and all this? What, well, what know, you think my mind go. No, not, I know. <laughs> um, the, um, sure, absolutely. Like we're always, everything we do think, you know, say, feel is, is either investing in who we say we want to be you know, or it's gluing us to really, I want to say that it could be the past, but 
you don't even want to be, you, you can't act the way you're acting today and expect to have a different tomorrow. I mean, it's just as simple as that, right? Yeah. It's always about expansion and something, I don't know why, what you said that triggered this, but I was at a, a, um, a group I was teaching this workshop at last week. And the woman said to me, we were talking about dreams and visions. And she said that I, I shared what I always wanted to do with this friend of mine. And he looked at me and he said, well, you obviously don't really want to do it or you would have done something about it. And she was so offended by that, that she wanted to share. She's like, I can't believe you said that. And I was thinking, and I actually kind of blurted out in my restrained sort of way. <laughs> I, I probably shouldn't have said this, but I said, you know, there actually is truth in that for all of us, because, because we say we want this and we know what to do. How, no one except me has ever done this with working out, right. Or eating or whatever, but we promise ourselves the thing and but we, we keep feeding the version of ourselves that can't get there. And that is, I agree with you, that is an ultimate betrayal to that fit, healthy, you know, uh, rejuvenated version of yourself. And, the, and one of the main reasons to bring this back full circle is that we're so stuck in those emotions that are still sitting in our bodies that we would rather protect. For some reason, we just are afraid to, to have what we want. Like well, we would rather stay in that fear and that, that looping and the bad feeling and, oh, I cheated on myself than just, than just, you know, walking through the fear. Like everything you want truly is on the other side of the fear of doing it. So here's something, and I use this with my clients and it just occurred to me that this would be so helpful for us to recognize is look in every human being, there is an empowered part of you that not only wants it, but is willing to do whatever it takes to get there. The trusting, reliable part of you. And then there is a disempowered part. Another way to think about this is there is an adult version of you, a grown up, and there is a child, the toddler that we were talking about before. And then we could even take it and say there's an even further evolved part of you that is standing in the future, calling you forward, right? Like rooting for you. So sometimes the emotions that take us out they, they feel actually collapsing in our body. Shame is one of those. You will notice it wants to tighten you, condense you. Any time, though, that we notice that we feel weak, uh, hopeless, helpless, humiliated, like we feel our bodies seize up, clench in, want to round toward ourselves, it's not a problem. Just recognize, okay, this is calling to the disempowered part of me. Now imagine that there's a wise parent, a good grown up in you, and go to that child within you and give the comfort, give the love, give, and then give the evidence for something new being possible. And then just bring that child within you along that disempowered part, just don't shame her, don't kick her, don't slap her, don't hide her, don't, no, no more of that. Don't say mean things to her, do not. Be nice, <laughs> be kind, stand in your adult self, in your empowerment, and now move in the direction that you wanna go being mean to yourself and rejecting parts of yourself and throwing shit on the disempowered part of you does not help. It feels good in the moment. It feels powerful, just like having an angry outburst does, but it leaves you feeling in the sad, same, right? No, no more. Just be nice, 
be kind, and lead in a new way. And that will build trust within yourself and within your life. It's not a problem. That part lives in all of us. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to respond to this because um, everything you said is absolutely true. And it, but it took me, but, and it took me back. First of all, it reminded me of this book I used to read to my kids called The Little Me and the Big Me, which is oh, the exact of it. <laughs> it's, it was written in like the 40s or the 30s. Ooh, I'm going to look it up. It's a really old book. I think I still have it. Um, but anyway, so what it, what it kind of brought to my, awareness was the many, many years of therapy that I went through years and years ago, which was all about the, the inner child, you know, when all that stuff was coming out, like, when would that have been? I don't know. Let's not talk about that, but like 80, early eighties, maybe. And so I know too, I think and everyone is different. I, I'm not discounting at all. I totally agree with you. And at the same time, um, oh, this is going to get me in trouble if I talk about this. No, if it's not. I, well, I, I'm listening to these other voices. That, um, something. So remember when we were talking about narcissism? And yeah. I have learned so much from observing, and now we're going to shift into business for a second, but in okay. business, I've learned so much from watching the difference between men, how they navigate like entrepreneurs and women who come out of corporate and go into their own business. And, you know, the rest of us talk about generalization, <laughs> but um, I think there's really something about understanding that that adult, that big me, because there was a tendency, I know at least the people that I was around during all the, and that was like years, like years of therapy. It's crazy how much time, but because of that, you know, there's always another thing to heal. There's always another thing. And what, what you wind up doing is focusing on the pain and then baby steps going forward, which makes a lot of sense at different times. So I'm not discounting that. And at the same time, you can move really fast. Absolutely. Like, so like what, what I learned from these, these people was um, forget that, like blow him off. It's like, it's like the guy who cheats on you and you've got 14 other guys here holding out your favorite kind of flowers and wine and everything else. So I think it's like, it's not, I guess, I don't even know what I'm trying to say. It just, there's this other energy that's like. Well, and it's not uh, an either or. It's yeah, not I'm not like saying it is. I'm just trying to bring this, this yeah. out. Because yeah. you can take what you want and you don't, you don't have to focus on so much about the trauma. Like no. you can just, um, yeah. So uh, anyway, that's, I, I was going to say something else, but I, I lost my thought. Um, anyway, go ahead. It'll come back. No, I, I just, just in that I agree with you. Like when you introduced me earlier, you said, okay, she does grief recovery and life coaching. And the biggest thing, what the way that I would differentiate the two is life coaching really is casting a vision big enough to pull you through the pain of transformation. That can yeah. be entrepreneurship. That can be whatever it is. But this idea that it it doesn't have to all be slow or continue but the things from the past continue to come up and it's really helpful if you've got a broad overview and you're not trying to kick parts of you to the curb 
And I understand what you're talking about, about being on this like incremental treadmill that feels like, where's it going to go? Right. Like, especially if it just seems to be tunneling down, down, down towards historical pain versus the life that a woman desires for herself and also making room that there are people in pain that do not recognize that they that a life a big life in vision is even possible right now right yeah. so just working in the both and I, I remembered what, what I was going to say too. And cause I loved when you were saying, you know, there's this adult within you and then there's this child and there, and it's not either, or it's both. And I love, um, I recently have revisited the e math by Michael Gerber. Uh-huh. And I just love, I just love him, but the way he talks about all the people that live in your brain, because that's the truth. And when you have a bigger perspective and you see the vision and you look at your life, you know, there's all, we always talk about the CEO of your life, right? When you look at it like that, then you can more easily understand where you need to um, kind of build up your discernment and your skills and you can't, you really can't always be the visionary and the integrator and everyone else, the technician, all the, the roles that he speaks about. And you certainly can't build a business that way. So why do we think we can build a life from one perspective? Exactly. You know, we need to be able to be fluid and move into all these things. And I think ultimately, at least for me, that's where the trust is. It's like the trust really is in the journey. Like we're, this is good. Like life is good. (laughs) So it's good. Like it's not the end of the world. I had a business partner once that was always saying that. And at first I was like, oh my God, I'm not in trouble. Cause I was so raised with everything you did was punishable. I mean, like hyper vigilant. So he was saying that all the time. I was like, oh, wow, it's not the end of the world perspective. Okay. That's one of the things I'll like, one of my favorite sayings for myself is it's all provision. Okay. So if that's the truth, where is provision in this? And when we ask our brain for answers, yeah. It's a beautiful thing because it gives it. Yes, absolutely. We get whatever we're focused on. So if I'm like, okay, this is provisional somehow, where's my provision? Yeah. And then all right, it starts to bubble to the surface. But we are at time and um it is a big topic, trust. So it's so simple, really, though. And so simple. It's so simple and it. And it, I know that when you hear the word often, I don't know, I don't know where people default to, but you can default wherever you want, right? So thank you so much. I think that was amazing. I really enjoyed our time together. And next week, I don't remember what our topic is. I don't even know if we, I don't think we have. I I don't remember that we've put it on the books. Well, when you come, oh, I actually did because I put it on the clubhouse room. I think we're talking about letting go. Oh, awesome. Did we do that? Are we doing that again? I think we're talking about letting go. And if we already broached that topic, I think we can again. Yes. I think there's a lot. Yeah. I'm, I'm almost positive next week. I don't think we've done it for courageous conversations. I don't know. Maybe we did. Okay, well, I want to, I want to thank anyone and everyone who watched this. Thank you, Lisa and Michelle. It's always really, it's just really fun. I learned so much from doing these. It's, it's and, rich. Yeah, it's really good. And I hope that this opened up some amazing, um, courageous conversation that you can have with yourselves and your friends. And we will be back next Monday at 2 p.m. Standard Time. Ciao, everyone, for now. Ciao. Ciao.